All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Tipples Virtual Wine Tasting with Elizabeth and Jeff Baudre here in beautiful, stormy Gainesville, Florida. Uh, this week, we're going drinking the M. Chapoutier Petit Rouge Creuse Hermitage Blanc. It's a lot of French. That is. <laughs> so if you've not already done so, go ahead and pop that bottle open and pour yourself a glass. Like so. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Ideal serving temperature on this guy is around 40 degrees to get started. Um, I like to put my whites in the refrigerator for about an hour to take them from room temperature down to the, you know, the cool level I want. I mean, if you over chill it and it's all the way down to 32, you know, or 33, whatever your fridge is, it'll warm up. It'll be fine. But I prefer to try and angle it around 40. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's jump to the first slide. I'll talk about food pairings and such. Thank you. Excellent. So here we are um, from the Northern Rune in France. We'll talk about specifically where that is later on. Uh, ratings in this guy, Venice 91, James Suckling 91. Food pairings, lobster bisque, pan-seared sea bass, steamed clams and mussels, shiitake nigiri sushi. And we're having grouper, so that should work with it. Yep, right? okay. we're having grouper, should be cool. great. So yeah, this is a seafood, lighter fare kind of wine for sure. Um, not just because it's white, but because it has a high, nice high zingy acid to keep it fresh as well, which always works well with those. So, um, Let's go back to not sharing. The wine grape on this guy uh, is Marsan. Okay. So you see um, typical of most French wines, not listed on the on the bottle, which we'll talk about the label in a few minutes, oh, yeah. right? Huh. It's going by region. Prosermitage is the region, and then it's their block from that area, though that can vary. In this case, though, we're talking about 100% Marsan. Now, this area normally does white blends. Mm -hmm. Marsan being one of the most important, you know, uh, blending, grapes. blending grapes in that, mm -hmm. you know, and usually dominant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I love to do, and again, you say, oh, well, what does Marsan taste like right. on its own? We get to find out tonight. Mm -hmm. Alcohol content, 12 and a half percent. So, you know, for a white wine, it's a top edge, yeah. you know, a yeah. uh, good standard, um, certainly not low. And uh, age ageability on this guy, so it's a white. It's going to be you know less age, but the way they grow it in this region tends to be a little higher acid, uh, up to ten years actually, even 10. though it's a even though it's a white. So we're right in the middle of that right now. Yeah, since two thousand seventeen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it does have. It's one of those that that does specifically age in a way that is appreciated. Um, it gets a little darker in color and gets some nuttiness going on. So I'm going to be. It'll be fun to discuss whether it's begun getting into that area yeah. or not, since it's right down in the middle. You always appreciate that, but yeah. it's not always appreciated in the wine world. Mm -hmm. So you're saying this one, it is appreciated in the wine world. Yes. Okay. This one, everyone's finally catching up to me. <laughs> <laughs> you're a trendsetter. That's me. Mm -hmm. That's me. Yep. All right. I would say there is a little, little touch of that. Nuttiness. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, getting our first impressions in here now that I've kind of run over the quick things. I um, feel like I got, like when I first smelled it and I don't mm -hmm. I don't get it as much, but I feel like it was like a big whiff of apple for me. Okay. And now I'm not getting that as much anymore. And apple would be a great call on that. Um, they tend to call it quince. Um mm -hmm. It's apple, you know, okay. it's like a, a really tart apple, okay. you know. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also with these kind of bright floral notes mm -hmm. and almost like a candied tropical note. And in the chat, Chris mm -hmm. says smells like orange blossom. Mm -hmm. So that goes right along with that floral. And, and to me, when you're saying candied too, because orange blossom is a sweet right. smelling. Yeah, it's like a sweeter yeah. citrus. Right, right. And then um, Robin said some apple and nutmeg. Mm -hmm. So that's that nuttiness that you were talking right. about then. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then. Uh, I think that's Chris, I believe. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it says Pookie and Pookle. I'm That's right. not sure who that is. Honey almond peach. Yep. I like that. I like honey, honey, absolutely. Oh, oh, see, I see it. It's Paul. And oh, Lena. there it is. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to find out later yeah. who's who. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. But yeah. Honey, I like that. Peach. I like the honey, the almond calm. And I will say that this is developing a little bit of that nuttiness. Now, this is an unoaked wine. It's unoaked, and they use no malolactic uh, fermentation in there. The mallow is when they let it rest mm -hmm. a little bit. And it's a, a, a way of fermenting to bring richness and creaminess into your wine. So when you have a big buttery Chardonnay, for example, mm -hmm. it's not just the barrel. Okay. It's malolactic fermentation okay. and then the barrel. This guy does neither to keep it fresh. But you get this nutty quality to it, mm -hmm. which gives it kind of some nice, that weight yeah. and roundness. And that is part of the grape in this case. Is that unusual for France not to be oaked? Uh, it depends on the area. Okay. Mm -hmm. But right. no, I'd say there's quite a bit of France that goes on it. That goes on oak. Yeah, a lot of the Cote de Rhone, um, you know, the Southern Rhone, white blends and such are unoaked completely as well. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of areas that go unoaked okay. uh, on the whites. Mm -hmm. So ripe citrus. Um, would you anyone go with like uh, peach? Maybe a tart peach? Honey, almond oh, peach. Oh, almond peach. Well, there we go. Somebody did. That's right. Cookie said that. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. And I like that we talked about nutmeg. I could go maybe a, a hint of some green herbs as well. It's like maybe a tarragon-y thing, something like that. Maybe fennel on the palate. So um, Chris Montral said, no oak, no mallow. That's oh, why he likes that's it. That's why you like it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's and, and you can see why this is so good with those lighter dishes, you know, with uh, seafood and such. This is not gonna, it's not gonna turn, if you want a nice bright, say ceviche dish and you mm -hmm. don't wanna add a buttery quality to that, it's supposed to be acid bright, yeah. right? This is, this is your kind of- Yeah, absolutely. Or some kind of a piccata dish, it'll complement it. But without being too wispy, right? In no way are we like we're we're giving a lot of nice flavors and even some bold flavors. It's not just like lemon water. We mm -hmm. say, oh, okay, there's no mallow. It's just lemon water. You know, nothing yeah. interesting. Yeah. We've got a lot to talk about. Which, so I'm having a lot of fun with this one. Yeah, we actually have a couple more comments. Mm -hmm. So um, Robin's saying also almond, but she's talking raw almond, mm -hmm. not roasted. I agree with that too. And I agree with that. She said or pistachio or cashew. Mm -hmm. And okay. then Chris says white peach specifically. White peach, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's it's like brighter notes than mm -hmm. with the white. And then um I don't know this. Carambola? Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually not familiar with it either. Yeah. Justin, do you want to take the mic and tell us about that? I don't know what carambola is. Starfruit. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. All right. All yes. Right. Okay. Then yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I would go with that. Also, we are like literally eating chicken piccata right now. Oh, uh, I think it's like a great pairing. Fantastic. <laughs> that wonderful. That's great. Yeah. yeah, I think I think the, the wine is is just sweet enough uh, with the very acidic food to really complement it. I think without the food, there is a little bit of a solidity. There is a little bit of acidity there um, that isn't present when you're pairing it with something that's very, very sharp like chicken piccata. So it, they play really nicely together. Yeah, and I like that call. We hadn't discussed that. I hadn't gotten to the like minerality because mm -hmm. I usually go there on the on the texture side. Right. So texture will start with a nice fresh acidity, but not a biting acidity, mm -hmm. right? It keeps it really fresh and tart. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like it's attacking my palate. So what I'm wondering is since we're having it with grouper later, when I put lemon on my grouper, then what Chris is saying is that that's going to pair even better. Yeah, it'll be it yes, once I put yeah. that lemon on it. Okay. It'll be a nice complimentary. Yeah. Uh, and then he mentioned, and then the last thing we've talked about is um some salinity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's from the minerality where it's grown. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you get a nice little little that is like a little salt. Mm -hmm. And it's what hangs out on my palate right now is almost like a like a citrus with a little a little salt on it. Mm -hmm. You know, like a little lemon, little with a dash of salt. Yeah. I don't know. I'm happy. Sounds like most people are. Excellent. Well, let's jump back over to the slides. Okay. We'll talk about the label. Mm -hmm. 
All right, the label on this guy. Uh, so we got right at the top, M. Chapoutier. We got the vintage, that's pretty easy to see, which is nice. Petit Rouge, that is uh, basically a reference. To the, it's, a, it's a personal reference to their area. It's nothing specific to the region um, at large. This is a Braille label? It is. That's they, um, fantastic. Chapoutier does that with all their labels. They should all do that with their labels. Yeah. So um, if it's, well, I'll, I'll cover that in a minute uh, after we get this. Uh, Crows Hermitage, that's the location, right? Appalachian Crows Hermitage. Um, and then once again, they've got the name again down here. So you're like, okay, well, very specific region. Um, you'll see on here what it does not tell you, right? It doesn't say Blanc anywhere. Well, it's got to use your you eyes. Just look at right? it and see that it's Blanc. And it doesn't say what's in, right. but that is a very French way to do things, and it's usually Italian as well. So it's an old world way to do sure. things. My reference, I'm going to tell you, my eyes really you can't, can't read enough. that. No. <laughs> And, uh, and I like to look at these because I know the wine already, but so a lot of times I don't read. Yeah, I like to look kind of look at a wine and say, what would I pick up? So if I looked at this, I would think, well, I need the brow. So <laughs> that's a small sure. font. Anyway. So do you want me to get reading glasses for you? <laughs> or we can have one of the youngins read it. That's right. Us. So once again, Petit Rouge, Pros and Retires. So um, let me get down here. Imported by... Terlato, actually, I know those guys do some awesome things, um, but Terlato may or may not be one of those that's big enough to mm -hmm. to learn um, in the in just regular wine drinking world. And then I wanted to see, I don't see on here estate grown, right? Uh, wait, there it is. Uh, there it is. So, so it's in it's in the uh, it's in the small print there that it is. So it's interesting because they don't put like a big estate grown on there. Um, Chapoutier is a combination. They are a negotiant and a state run, um, which is kind of is an interesting. Most people are one or the other, uh, especially when you see how many locations they grow wine. The, the large proportion that are a state grown mm -hmm. is very impressive. Okay. So, um, so if I see it here, and it did look like it from when I was there, that this should be their And I'm not just using to help him out i would have to take my lenses out to read the label then i could read it fine but then i wouldn't be able to see anything on the screen so <laughs> so all right so specific location it's going to leave some questions this is one that is more than likely much more helpful for most people to get some some to help. be able to get some help from, from the store expert. and say right yeah. and say okay what am i doing and, and really most people aren't walking in the store thinking hey do you have any more stuff? You know, like, <laughs> sure. So this is probably going to be something where they come in, like we have at the store a lot, mm -hmm. and they tell us what they're having for dinner that night. Or if they say, look, I have somebody, I want to do something different. They drink Sauvignon Blanc mm -hmm. or, or un -Oak Chardonnay. Then I could see those as crossovers. Sure. Uh, Oak Chardonnay, not so much. Viognier, yes. And so this one, like a lot of French, mm -hmm. could use a little extra help. With you know, with for most with people. guidance from with an a little expert. extra guidance with an expert. Okay. Um, that is one of the things, and it can be a deterrent to Americans jumping in with the French, mm -hmm. uh, which is a shame. Um, I get their I get their history, I get their traditions, I respect them, but it does make that one layer for most Americans. They're then going to need a little extra guidance to grab that bottle. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why I think one of the things that like. The fact that you ask people, well, what are you having for dinner or something mm -hmm. to be able to help people out? Because I think it's very difficult to be able to ask the question because I think it's hard for a lot of people to say, I don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. Can you, you know, sure. help me out with that? Yeah, we try to be proactive. Yeah. Um, you know, but here's the flip side is once you try this, mm -hmm. I don't think it's in any way difficult to enjoy this bottle. Right, right. Absolutely. Right. It's just maybe hard to choose it on your own. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is not one of those where, you know, some wines, especially some old world wines, I could say, well, you're really going to want it with the food or you can gain an appreciation for what they're working for in the history of the area. This guy, I think, is easy to like. They, I think, though they, character driven. Yeah, old world wines can be very um, challenging to new wine drinkers as mm -hmm. far as your, your palate. Yeah. Right. I think some of the new world wines are a little more palate friendly to newer wine drinkers mm -hmm. yeah but yeah i can i can see though like i was saying there are multiple scenarios where i could see people that are drinking adjacent flavors that i could say hey give this guy a shot i think you're gonna like it mm -hmm. so hmm. we have 
the question about Braille, which you said is coming up later. Right. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, it is. Hold on, it's coming. That was just a teaser. That's right. Um, and then we have another one. Are they related or do they work with the, I don't know how to pronounce it. The Bill of Hot. Bill of Hot. Um, because they also do Braille. Right. So that was where I was going to go. I wanted to cover the label first. This is the same company. Oh, okay. So I was going to say, yeah. um, many of you may recognize the name M. Chapoutier because that tasting that we had in the store was the M. Chapoutier tasting. When was that? That was the one in the store with the um, the representative, their brand representative oh, right, for, the, right, right, right. for the U.S. That's was right. there. Mm -hmm. um, and so Bill of Hot is owned by the same people. Um, and it is it shows. So here we are in the Northern Rhone, uh, which we'll look at a map. Actually, let's, I think. Okay. Um, Bill of Hot's in a different area of France. We'll do it. Well, let's, uh, so we'll cover that. I've got a map to show you guys where their locations are uh, later on. But yes, good eye, good memory. I was going to ask that if you guys would remember. In fact, I was going to be a little meaner about it and be like, okay, <laughs> who can tell me why M. Chapotier should sound familiar? You were all there almost. All right. So the origin of this grape is in the Rhone Valley, right? So um, it's from the town of Marsan. So they named it Marsan. <laughs> all right. I like it. That'll work. The most popular white grape in the Hermitage area of the Northern Rhone. We'll look at that map in just a moment. Um, and it's added up to 15% percentage in the reds as well. Oh, wow. So it's used quite a bit. Yeah. So what are they trying specifically to add when they add this? Uh, trying to add? Acidity. Okay. Usually, problem, you know, acidity and a little more elevated lift on the nose too, on the palate. Is it called Merson outside of France? It's got a couple of other names, but it's almost always Marsan. Okay. I mean, Switzerland has a name, but it's just not a name you're really going to see. So I didn't worry about it too much. Um, it can be, it's usually blended with Roussan, oh. <laughs> right? So you've got Marsan and Roussan as the important grapes, white grapes up in this Northern Rhone area. They're fun to say. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a finicky grape. It likes to be grown just right. So if you go too warm with it, it will it'll be happy and it will ripe, mm -hmm. uh, but it can really become overripe and get, but the Australians do that on purpose. Oh, so, okay. cause it is grown in, um, but it doesn't, it will under ripen really easily. So if it's too cool for too long without enough, it'll just be really tart and almost like lemon water won't okay. give you a lot going on there. So it does, it's more of a just right kind of thing, um, which is why it's not grown everywhere in France. So this is interesting that this is another case of where we have white grapes that look kind of reddish too. Right. What was the other one that was like that? Uh, Pinot Gris. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Pinot Gris is even more because they almost have swirls of red in mm -hmm. them, but this one's got a real orangey color to it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh. Well, and you can see like on the edges too, there's like some redness, mm -hmm. which is why you get that overall orange impression. But look at this one, it's mm -hmm. almost pink. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. So it's also grown in Switzerland, Spain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the U.S. But mostly it's blending. Uh, yeah, it's really, even here, it's usually blending. Okay. Um, I was really excited to find this one as, you know, 100%. So, <coughs> so I jumped on it. Uh, next one, please. So primary flavors, quince. So there's that tart apple, kind of an apple pear combo, I mean, you know, combo flavor. Mandarin orange, there's our citrus. And we talked about like that orange blossom, orange blossom and stuff. So you get that kind of brighter thing. Apricot, uh, acacia. acacia, and beeswax, a little honeyness. Yeah, that's... Right. So we're, we've hit a bunch of mm -hmm. these. Not every one is going to have all of them, right? right? So uh, dry, yeah, it's definitely dry. Medium body, sure. It's not a light wispy thing. It's, it's got basically the weight of a Chardonnay. Um, low to non tannin. Yep, it's a white. Medium low acidity. I would say this guy's a full medium at least. Yeah. If not a little, you know, oh, maybe I'd say medium plus even. Hmm. And higher acidity. Interesting point that they have here. We have a little higher acidity. That comes from grapes that are a little less ripe. That's going to have less sugar. We're less at 12 and a half. Okay. Uh, instead of 13 and a half yeah. on the bottom of this. So we're a little lower than at, than most on the ABVs. Right, we're below the range there by yeah. a percentage point. 
-hmm. So, um, but we've got a little higher acidity and that mm -hmm. was done by, that was done by choice. So, but you said this one can hang out for like 10 years. Right. So is, would that mean that a typical, because of the lower acidity, it's higher ABV, but lower mm -hmm. acidity. So do all Marsans hang out for, or not all, but you know, right. most hang out for 10 years or? No, it's going to be all kind of all over the place oh. because of that. So if you get to one that's say 13 and a half percent, you're kind of in a no man's land mm -hmm. where you're going to have lower acid and not particularly high alcohol. Okay. So that guy's probably going to need to be consumed fresh okay. where the Aussies will grow it with the high ABV mm -hmm. because then the higher ABV makes up for the low acid okay. and then takes over with ageability again. Sure. And so it's almost like on each end of the scale on the extremes, you right. get more ageability. Right. And then it's like, and but in the middle, you need, it's a drink fresh. Mm -hmm. Fresh air. So you're still going to get three years, four years. Sure. So next one, please. All right. So grape anatomy on this guy. Uh, we're basically dealing with kind of a balanced white grape. You know, you've got, you've got a medium skin on the outside, particularly here. It's going to be a little thicker skin because of the, the wind in this area. There's oh, a lot okay. of wind, which we'll yeah. cover that when we go to the region. Um, so you got a medium skin where you could go with a thinner skin, depending on where it's grown, mm -hmm. but this guy's more medium, uh, balanced with acidity because we don't have a crazy amount of acidity. So it's yeah. not about intensity in the middle. It's a bit more of a balanced grape all okay. the way through. Next one. Thank you. All right. So where are we? Here we are in France. We are in basically Southeastern France. Okay. Right here, just above the middle of the latitude. And within France, we are right here in this little area. So we're in the Northern Rhone Valley. Southern Rhone, obviously, you can see, has a lot more area than where they can produce. Mm -hmm. um, the Northern Rhone is much smaller all along the Rhone River. And uh, when we were talking about M. Chapoutier, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about the different locations, the wines that we had in the store in the tasting, mm -hmm. we're from over here in the Languedoc. Okay. So they own property here, 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 here. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They're all over. We'll, okay. we'll see a map of their things. But... <laughs> oh yeah, they have some here. <laughs> anyway, so right now we're here. We're in okay. the Northern Rhone Valley. Um, so within the Northern Rhone, we are in Crows Hermitage, right? So it's, that's this area here. The most famous area within the Northern Rhone is Hermitage, which is one basically mountain. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. And so that is that little purple area right there. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's Hermitage. <laughs> then this is Crows Hermitage. So the, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, here we go. Southern France, two distinctive areas, uh, Hermitage, Crows, Hermitage. Uh, crows means groove, and it's a reference to how hilly the area is, and there are okay. a lot of valleys and things. Um, uh, along the banks of the Rhone River, very hilly, alluvial soil deposits, that means clay and sand and pebbles. I was just going to ask what alluvial meant. There you go. <laughs> uh, designated in 1937 as a growing yeah. area. 92% uh, of the production here is Syrah. Um, uh, actually, 92% includes Syrah, Marsan, and Roussan. So those three grapes, mm -hmm. you know, like we were talking about those, the other two are white. Um, that's 92%. The other 8% is Viognier. So they do grow some Viognier as well, which within, they basically blend it. Australians grow a lot of Viognier, and they actually tend to have a lot of single varietal Viognier which is a fun way to taste that. We should probably do that sometime. There we go. Setting that down. Yeah. Windy weather, uh, like I said, the Le Mestral comes from north to south. Okay. And regularly hits sustained 45 mile an hour winds, just a lot. Wow. I mean, it's not just, oh, that's occasionally. It's a, um, every day is windy, <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> and it thickens the skins. It also lowers the humidity, so that protects the grape growth, which is one reason you get so much growth all along here, and um, reduces pests because the, the wind's blowing oh, and they, right. they can't live there. Yeah. It's just constant, constant wind and low humidity 
They just don't have a lot of pests in that area. So it all is very helpful for wine production. So, and here's what it looks like. Hilly, gorgeous, there's the river. And even here, like you see, actually, this is the vineyards right here. Yeah, and you can see them, mm -hmm. like, see right here too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I wouldn't mind going. Here we are. Oh, can you go back to that? I was mm -hmm. trying to see. I guess it's like it is small terraces. At first, it, it just looked like it was angled, but I think there's yeah. like little small yeah. terraces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then here's another view. Well, it's a beautiful area. I figured yeah, it deserves yeah. three shots, right? Absolutely. So, M. Chaputier. Now, this is Michel Chaputier. Okay. But that is not what M. Chaputier is named for. It's named for his father, Mark. Okay. All right. But the winery that became M. Chaputier's had several names over the years, began in 1808. Oh, wow. Yeah. They've been around a hot minute. Jeez. So several name changes became M. Chaputier in 1955 when Marc Chaputier, Michel's father, okay. took over and renamed it. Okay. So this was not a family vineyard, it, but it was, it's continuously like farmed land that it's, it's always been well, for, yes. for wine vines. Right. Yeah. It has, and interestingly, it wasn't, didn't always involve the Chaputiers. Oh. Um, but then they did come in pretty early on, but it was always with partners. Okay. And so it was two names, and mm -hmm. it was then so and so and Chaputier. And then okay. it became kind of solidified with the Chaputiers. Okay. Um, and then, and it was a little before Mark, but then Mark said, okay, it's time to, we're the ones running it. It's just going to be in Chaputier. Okay. So um, it's a combination, negotiant and estate. They own many estates in all those different areas that I mentioned. Yeah. We'll see a map. But we they also to Spain for some of it too. Oh, Spain, so. Portugal, Australia, Germany also, in addition to multiple regions in France. Um and I said I was putting here you might remember the name from when we already did that tasting. Um, so Michel took over the wine the operations for the family mm -hmm. um, and direct control when he was 26. Wow. In 1990. Wow. Yeah. He is a big into art and interested. In basically, if you look at the description on the website, he's interested in everything in life and how it can inspire him. Mm -hmm. He just believes in living life. And that Good wine that. is an important part of that. He is the one that changed, like, and almost immediately he said, all right, we're going biodynamic for all of our locations, including Soul City. Wow. Yeah. So they immediately switched. Um, he did that in 1990? 1990. Very much ahead of the curve on that. Though. Right. Mm -hmm. So here are, their, um, here are their areas of, of ownership. Here they are up in Germany, France, Spain, and Portugal, and Austria. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Biodynamic. They really do believe that the quality of these grapes, you know, quality of the wine starts from its... You're just helping to express good quality mm -hmm. wine from the grapes. You've got to start with great grapes. It's not about manipulating. And that's really, that's a French, you know, that's a French style. You know, time and again, almost, most French winemakers are into expressing the terroir and the grapes that they take great pains to grow beautifully, rather than just covering it up with oak and manipulation in order to get a certain flavor so i feel like most of the people that that in you know, the wines that we feature in the wine of the week they do feel this way mm -hmm. because i i feel like i'm hearing like a similar story about it every week that they okay well we do this to protect the land or we do this to you know make sure that our community is is protected or you know all these different things we've got evidence of that in california and australia and in south america right. and and so to me it's is what you're saying that like it's very french in that more of the french winemakers do that than let's say in other regions of the world yeah as a proportion mm -hmm. of the winemakers yes right. i would say that i mean I was, the Italians can be very much that way too, but the French are really, really into it. Okay. And then, well, they've been doing all of this a very long time. So, 
Yeah, and if you were to what if if someone were to argue back with me, I could concede. Okay, it's more of an old world behavior mm -hmm. than a new world behavior, mm -hmm. rather than saying specifically French. Mm -hmm. I could go with that. I still think the French are probably the highest yeah. percentage of winemakers that really well. They should be leading uh, the way on things with wine. Honestly, they've been doing it well. France and Italy the longest. So, but I mean. Well. Yeah, they've dominated the world market right. the longest. Right, certainly. right. Yeah. So, but um, it's interesting because I think being part of this group, and this is where I'm getting my wine education from, mm -hmm. I it becomes, my view is, oh, well, all winemakers like care mm. about the land. Oh, and, right. You know, care about pesticides and people and all this. And then I remember the issues that some California grapes have right with um the chemical that we want right. to make. yeah it's i think <laughs> the fact that we see this time and again uh -huh. um with our wines it's because i'm choosing good quality okay. wines you know um yeah it's it's going to be more of that mass produced okay. you know kind of silly wine yeah, and, or care. you know really i would i could call it casual table wine but some of them go a little below that mm -hmm. but let's just go you know under the table wine. yeah there's like, <laughs> the, some of the mass produced stuff that it's just a machining, you know, it's a machine yeah. process, a, a company, they just are only worried about maximizing what they can, you know, how many gallons mm -hmm. they can produce per acre. So seeing that is not, it's not that that's never done in France, but it's a much smaller percentage than say what happens in the U S or Argentina, some areas in Chile. Okay. Uh, certainly Australia. Yeah, because I just, I, and we can move on and on, but I just, every week I feel like that's great. They're doing so much for the yeah. earth and, you know, and right. so, yeah, I like hearing those stories, which obviously this winery is part of it. So should I advance? Yes, please. All right. So, and by the way, to the point, this is one of the modern pictures. It's not an old picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're still using horses to go through some of these areas because like they, you've got the hillsides and it's trellised and they're, trying to minimize the, you know, the use of machinery and such. You've got, you've got a horse running, <laughs> running a plow through the middle there. So one day we need to do grapes with the, the ducks that run through. Um, oh yeah. That, yeah. South African winery. Is it South African? Okay. Mm. Yeah. We need to do something from there. Oh wait, we have a chat. Okay. So I wouldn't be behind <laughs> the horse. <laughs> Oops. I advanced. You already saw this. Um, go up. But I think we did. The, we miss a thing, or no? I don't think so. Nope. Nope. That's okay, it. that was the last one. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and stop, and uh, okay. we'll talk about any additional thoughts with all the additional information that I threw at you. Any any new things to discuss before we uh, move yeah. on? We kind of went quickly through it today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, not too quickly. Huh? I don't know if I have any other notes, but I will say I find white wines to be pretty one note usually uh, and less interesting when we're drinking them. But I actually really liked this one. I thought that it had a lot to it. And I think that it changed a little bit depending on whether I was having it with food or without food. Um, so I do appreciate that. Nice. Yeah, I, I think and I mentioned it in the chat, but I think that's what I like a lot about Old world, old world wines in general, but specifically a lot of like French whites, Viognier's, stuff like that is like, I think that they go really well by themselves, but they go so well with food and they're so different. And they, they're, they're able to flex kind of up and down depending on like, hey, is it just a hot 4 p.m. Sunday, you just wanna open up something nice type of wine? Or is it, it, it'll go really well with your food type of wine. Uh, and, and I think this really goes well both ways. Excellent. Yeah. And I'm sorry I missed that in the chat. It, oh, no, no, no. I tend to minimize the chat when we have the slides up. So, <laughs> so I'm glad you said it. And then we do have, um, Rachel said she enjoys it more with food because it is a little salty. Uh, yeah. And that's, we did mention that earlier. It was right no i think she was saying she enjoys it with salty food oh sorry yeah. okay yeah. Mm -hmm. and more with salty food okay mm -hmm. what are you eating we had some mussels and we have like a roasted chicken but it's kind of salty mm -hmm. like it has 
onions. Yeah. Nice. Well, and I, I, I like that comment about, you know, some of the old world wines. Like this guy, it, it does have, it has a lot going on. There was a lot to yeah. discuss with all the different flavors. It can, that makes it even more flexible with what you compare it with because mm -hmm. you can do a little piece of it. You know, it doesn't have to go with every single thing or, and it has more than one way to win. Oh, true. As yeah. you know, with pairing because it has more than one thing going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you can have it with, um, oh, and then, sorry. And Pookie and Puko are eating it with sushi. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, with some fried chicken. Mm -hmm. Sure, which I mean, yeah, we've talked about a lot of different things here. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's the fun classic. thing, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's that's a wine that has a lot to say. When you have a lot of, you say, oh, what about this? What are, and you keep coming up with one more thing to mention about the wine. Mm -hmm. And I know that was brought up as well too. So often, you know, that will happen kind of a little more often with white wines, and that's what I love. I like the character-driven part of this, but the fact that it's so easy to like too. Okay. So to me, those combos together make a really nice white wine. So you're saying with white wines, it happens more often that you can, that it pairs with more? No, um, no. I was saying it's usually a red wine that you oh, get more okay. things to discuss. Yeah. No, so many whites, even if they're really tasty, are kind of linear. Sure. You know, it's like, eh, one or two tastes yeah. and you're done. And you're tasting what you're going to taste. And that's you're tasting it. it and yeah. It's going to be helpful. Well, is part of the reason that we're, because I know like we, We've had it open now, what, an hour? Yeah. Okay. So it it tastes very similar to when we first opened it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect a big evolution from white. Yeah. But does it, because it is more a more ageable wine, does it change more? It would, yeah. Even as a That's white. likely. Yeah, okay. even as white that you'd get more because it has okay. that ageability. Okay. Because the acid's going to react with the air content mm -hmm. on it and change a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And on Christmas Mar Mar Green, something fatty or salty works with it. Yeah. It's nice. definitely sushi. Yeah. I think Unagi would be really good with it. Speaking of sushi. Unagi. Mm -hmm. That's the sea urchin, right? No, no, that's the, the eel. Oh, that's the eel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd that's be good. right. Because I never want sea urchin again. No, that's that's good <laughs> enough. Maybe you'd like it with this. <laughs> you can try it and tell me how it is. Okay. All right, let's jump over. And next, please. All right, so this guy got a pair of 91s uh, on there, uh, putting it up in the outstanding category. Um, you know, I always like to cover this area just a bit. Um, up in the outstanding, though, effectively, the way it's used out there is a lot of the wine guys will give a 90 for any wine that I think most of us would, would consider, oh, this is a really good wine that I would definitely drink again and was worth my money. So they list it as outstanding, but to me, if I would say, hey, this is a really good, well-made wine that I would definitely drink again and was worth the money, I would probably say that equals a very good wine and outstanding could go from there to like a real wow, mm -hmm. right? But that's not effectively how it's used, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, you guys can do it <laughs> any way you want. Uh, so, uh, because out in the market, if you see an 85, most people look at that and think it was a failure. And I think that's ridiculous. I mean, the, the ratings are skewed and it's unfortunate, right? But, um, and beyond that, so what are we looking for? A, are there any flaws in this wine? Um, you know, was there cork taint or was it just poorly made? Is it, you know, that kind of a thing? Is, is it hazy and it's not supposed to be? No, it's well made. So then did I enjoy the wine, but then Beyond did I enjoy it? Is it a good representation? Because maybe you're not that into white wines or something, right? So just keep that in mind as you're looking at it. Yeah. And then, <laughs> but did it speak to you in any interesting ways? To me, those are the bonus points. So I like to look at it as, all right, I'm going to be up in the, if it's, if it's well-made and a good representation of the grape and I enjoyed it, I'm automatically going to be in the upper 80s, right? And then bonus points for things that stand out as particularly interesting. Is it really particularly good for that region or you know it was it was there something in the way it was made that made me think that it has a certain character that excited me a little bit more mm -hmm. and then i'm going bonus points on there and that's kind of how i would get to it anyway that's me so tell me what you guys think of this one all right 
there would be in the chat box. I'm go ahead and stop the share a moment yeah. and look at the chat. So Chris is saying a 92. Mm -hmm. um, and then Chris Montreal says, really like this wine. I'm giving this probably a little higher than I should because I personally really like it, 94. That's fair. And that should be part of your score. Do you personally really like it? Right. Absolutely. So wait and see if we have a couple more scores thrown in here. Yeah, I'm surprised on that. Normally they pile in. They do normally pile in. They're normally all like already there. And normally there's eight before I get done with my whole spiel about the uh, rating. <laughs> 91 from both the Hodgins? Okay. Yeah. All right. No. Just from Jerry. But Jerry, Jerry said it was both. Okay. <laughs> um, he, he's taking two votes. So Justin, I prefer funkier white wine. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good balance. 91. Um, and nice. then Robin said, I would also maybe go with a 92, but I think it would go well with a seafood boil. Mm -hmm. Depending on what you eat, I could definitely go to a 93-ish. Nice. Brenda, Brenda, 90, Rachel and David. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, David and Rachel. Yep. 90, both. Excellent. Um, for me, I would be a 90.5. Okay. Yeah. I like it. White wine is not my thing. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to having it with the grouper. Yeah. I think, that and I think, I think I'm going to experience exactly what, what Robin said is I am thinking it's probably going to bump up for me yeah. when I have the grouper. Um, yeah, I know we've been getting some over the weeks and I kind of like it when people are like this rating without food, this rating with yeah, food. Did you yeah. see how food pairings matter? Well, and it um, is an interesting thing because you said specifically the old worlds are like that because yeah. they expect you to be eating with it. Right. And I think it's more of that whole like eating and dining and enjoying life experience that they take more time with than we do as Americans. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not food as a function, just food food is part of life. And right. Living. Right. When I read books that are that are set in Italy or France and mm -hmm. they're there for hours and meeting the owners and oh, this is from so and so's farm and this right. is from yeah. That's it's a very different experience than than eating in even fine dining in America. Oh sure. So, and then we have, um, and then Justin said too, it actually seems to be opening up a bit more for me in the flavor as well, probably now that I finished eating. Yeah. Yep. I like it. Yeah, it did change a little bit. <laughs> right. And then the Snyder's beer, we can assess on its own wine, we need food. Mm. <laughs> so, real quick, I, based on Justin's comment, I was like, oh, to Chris, I was like, does this threat to you at all? Um, and it's hard to tell whether something tastes like Brett on its own, a uh, Brett Britannomyces for people who are not beer, I don't know. Um, but I was like, it's hard to tell whether it tastes like that or whether I'm just thinking of like Brett beers that are aged on white wine barrels. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think it kind of, to me has a, like a Saison or something like mm -hmm. that taste Saison. to it of like a funkiness that I can see what Justin was talking about, where it kind of like is even like what's the difference to him yeah i can see that I, I wouldn't go brett with it but i i would like to me the combination on the finish now that it's opened and warmed up a little bit after you get past the fruit is that kind of um that little bit of um nut uh almond skin so you've got a little bit of that mm -hmm. almost a little bit of a light bitterness mm -hmm. with a nuttiness and then that green herb that i talked about is kind of kicked up so when you get that finish um i get where you're going on that but yeah but i would go yeah i would call it more of, of that kind of a, a nutty that that nut skin and then the um the herbiness which kind of anchors it as you finish the the sip but it does come together with a, a little bit of um of almost a bitterness which i wouldn't go like on a lot of whites i would say if it was in there i would describe it probably a little bit more like citrus pith oh sure you know but i wouldn't go there with this guy i think it's a little more herby and nutty mm -hmm. than that And then Snyder's is it yeast that you're feeling? They, I don't think so. I think it's more from the grape um, because that is described as I was reading about the grape mm -hmm. that they're like, it can have a nutty quality, especially as it gets some age. Okay. So um, to me, that is uh, because it's hanging out over time and expressing itself. To me, that's most likely a quality of the grape 
rather okay. than the yeast. Okay. You wouldn't, you, the yeast would be a flavor that you taste it, the same the whole time. It should be a little early. It, just, it should just like, you know, it, yeah, that if, if anything affected More consistent. the yeast, it would kind of be early on when it was fresher and then, and then, then drop fade. off. Fade. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if it's hanging on, then it's, it's, yeah. it's, it great. should be more of what the grape itself is. Okay. And then Chris said, if it were beer, it would be Muscat. Okay. <laughs> Jeff said, well, like, like, like last night, like some of them had like a wine must to it and like the must, like the Muscat grapes and stuff like mm -hmm. that, to like that type of thing that you, um, you would have a Belgian and go like, oh, you can definitely get that like Sauvignon Blanc, like mm -hmm. grape must to it. Uh, obviously, it's a wine, so obviously it should have a great must to it. But um, yeah, if you're, if, you're, if you're talking about like a sour beer or, or or yeasty beer, I would be like, wow, I'll describe as a great must. But yeah, it just it made me think of you know like back in the day, evidently they the way they would say in job interviews, oh, if you were a fruit, what fruit would you be and stuff. So just imagine them, you know, interviewing this wine. If you were a beer. Right. What beer would you be? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? An Italian grape ale. Next. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we're thanking our sources then. Yep. Let's... So before we do that, any more questions, comments, observations, food pairings? I'm waiting long enough to make everyone uncomfortable. And Just then, caring. yes, <laughs> eventually That's somebody good. will say something. It's an interrogation technique. Okay. All right, here we are. Uh, thank you very much to Wine Folly, always. They're an amazing resource. I encourage everyone, if you ever want to do a little wine research, uh, learn more. Wine Folly is amazing. Their books, their uh, website, they're all fantastic. Videos on YouTube. Uh, 750.com Wikipedia, Wine Grapes Direct, that was a photo, and of course, Chapoutier themselves. So, next week, where are we off to? Well, I'm thinking we're going to red. You would be thinking correct. Okay. All right. Next week, we're staying in the old world. All right. Uh, and we will return to Tuscany in Italia. Ooh. Yes, we're going to have slow die. Oh, I missed that. Sorry. <laughs> I was when I was doing the thing. I missed one, only one error in the in the, this week. <laughs> it's it's the Lodi part of Tuscany. Mm -hmm. All right. So, all right, we're going to Tuscany. It's a super Tuscan uh, red blend. Uh, James Eckling, ninety three. Robert Parker, ninety two. Uh, food pairings: pate. I was trying to put the symbols on there, but I couldn't did a good job so it's pate it's all zero two three three to get the accent okay and pecorino so like a sheep's <laughs> a sheep's milk you know get something uh cheese mm -hmm. polenta and wild mushrooms with thyme or also buca milanese i was wondering so, but that's that's yeah. a, that's a little off the uh screen there. well i couldn't tell that when i made it so <laughs> anyway um incredible lineage in this guy fantastic wine uh it's a super Tuscan that I think is just fantastic. I love super Tuscan, so. so yeah, it's uh, it's excellent. It really, really is. So um, yes, join us next week. I really think you're going to love this wine. Um, if you don't, I'm going to judge you. So, um, <laughs> but thanks for joining this week. And I'm. it looks like everyone liked, every time I do a white, it's going to like, okay, here we go. Let's see how it does. <laughs> I was excited about this wine. Um, I would call it a success. It seems like it was well yeah, received. Absolutely. And then Robin is laughing because I knew the thing and you didn't. For doing oh, that, so. for changing. It, no, because the, the spaghetti western. Oh, this, oh, oh, oh right. I didn't see that. Spaghetti <laughs> western. That's right. It's a good joke. That is a good joke. That is a good joke. Because why? What's Super Tuscan? French varietals grown in Italy, mm -hmm. so very much, you know, to their west, yeah. right? So yeah. in Italy, so spaghetti western <laughs> is a really good alternative name for super Tuscan. I agree. That is. Chris, full credit. I like that. That's yeah, awesome. Well, Justin came up with that. Mason Cup. Oh, Justin said that. Shit. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. Full credit to Justin. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was referring to the Lodi. Oh, because of the... Yeah. <laughs>
Well, you know, it's funny. I um, I did have a Napa Valley Super Tuscan the other day. So, uh, really? yeah. So basically, they grow what they grew do. You know, what we think of in Napa, which is a lot of French bridles, and they put in some amazing Sangiovese. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Tuscany, you're dealing with Sangiovese, and then they grow some Cab or Merlot or you know one of the one of the French bridles. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go at it from California, you're talking, they're all growing Cab and Merlot and right, Cab Front. Right. And now they're throwing, they're growing some Sangiovese. They go at it from the opposite direction. So then they throw that in. And then, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know they did any Super Tuscans. And that that's actually really funny. Yeah. That's Super Tuscan from Blue Eye. Yep. Yeah. You'll have to change that slide before next week. Yeah, I will. Maybe I'll do it right away. Yeah. <laughs> before I forget. Good idea. All right. So. That's what we're having. Um, I have, yeah, so that's what we're having next week. Next week, I will be joining from Auburn, okay. probably. So so if anybody wants to remind me during the week to take a wine glass, <laughs> although I'll be packing up an apartment, so I may not take glassware. I'll just be drinking out of a coffee mug or something. Right like out of usual. this bottle, yeah. I could do that. Reese isn't going to drink it. It's just me. <laughs> it would look really classy on the video. That would too, be I great. Think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> All right, everybody. All right. Cheers to Marcel. It was well received. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers, everyone. Thanks Cheers. for coming.